This episode of Roadie Radio is brought to you by Ocean State Library's collection of ebooks and audiobooks. With the Free Libby app, you can access tens of thousands of ebooks and audiobooks. Use your library card to download library books directly to your mobile device to read or listen anywhere, anytime. When you borrow ebooks and audiobooks from Libby, there are no fines and nothing is ever overdue. Download the free Libby app today and start reading. You're listening to Rhodey Radio, Rhode Island Library Radio Online. Hi. I'm Lauren Walker, the Assistant Director at the Coventry Public Library, and I'm here with my husband, Nathan Walker, who's been working on the set of Hocus Pocus 2 for the past few months. Hey. All right. Should we just jump into some questions? Let's do it. All right. Um, So first, tell us what is your job title on set and what do you do? On this film, I am the key PA or key production assistant, and I oversee the other production assistants for the... AD department. Um, So I work directly underneath the assistant directors um, and I basically make sure that everything logistically is taken care of um, on set to the best of my ability. And I do a bunch of a bunch of other cool stuff that I can get into detail. Yeah, go for it. I'm sure people are really interested to hear like Like what sorts of things do you do? What's like a day in the life? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm, I start off as a production assistant. Most people do. Um, and you're kind of low man on the totem pole at that point. Um, and you're doing anything from, you know, as a regular production assistant or as a day player when you first start out. What's a day player? A day player is a, something we also call an additional production assistant or an additional PA. Um, and that's someone who comes on usually for a day or for a short period of time. Um, could be a week, could be a month, but they're not staffed on the project for the duration. Okay. Um, so they come on and, and usually you start off there and you work your way up. So you're doing anything at that point from, you know, getting coffee and breakfast orders to lockups, which are a lot of fun. Um, What's a lockup? So a lockup is making sure that no crew or pedestrians, if you're shooting outside, are walking through the shot, um, that they're not making noise because the mics that we record with on set are very, very sensitive and they can pick up human voices and even footsteps and things like that from a long, really long distance. So um, we have to make sure that um, there's no one coming in and out of the frame and um Also that we just don't have any pedestrians who don't know, especially if we're on the street, they don't know we're filming. They're having loud conversations and walking through and carrying on. Um, Then we got to make we got to shut that down. And that can be a lot of fun if you're in Boston or Providence (laughs) on a Friday night uh, near a college campus, which happens very often. Um, So I've been there, you know, in the middle of January, freezing my my took us off. (laughs) Um, Trying to trying to do lockups. And that's basically how you work your way up. Um, and then what I do more specifically is I make sure that all the day's paperwork is passed out. So we have things called call sheets, which are the daily schedule. They give a rundown of everyone on set, what their position is, um, all the scenes that we're shooting. Um, so I, I distribute those every day. Um, I also make sure that, um, daily time cards and, and things of like a clerical nature, administrative nature are collected and distributed. Um, and then I also kind of delegate lockups. So I make sure that, um, I pay attention to the shot. I work closely with the director, cinematographer, and the assistant directors to see what the frame is, to see where we need lockups, where we can't have people walking through frame. So it's really just about like making sure, um, everything runs really smoothly, Um, and I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like the, the catalyst through which all the other departments go through to get, um, things done without having to bother the, uh, other assistant directors who may have other things that they're preoccupied with that are of a more pressing nature. Well, it sounds like you're pretty busy. Um, I know that you work really long hours, so it sounds like each one of those hours is action packed. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Um, How many people work on a production like Hocus Pocus? Um, So it really depends on the scale, like the scope of what's happening that day. 
um, as far as if there's lots of stunts or pyrotechnics and what the parameters are around, uh, you know, the day's scenes. But generally, there's around 200 people on set, um, <clears throat> at least on this film. Mm -hmm. um, on other projects with larger budgets, there'll be more people. Um, but um, I'd say anywhere from 150 to to 200 people is pretty standard for like okay. a for like a mid to high budget film okay and how many of those people are coming from like la and how many are coming from the local area like here in rhode island um so there's actually i prob i'd say that there's like 75 percent of the people are from la and then like 25 are from the local area oh okay so whether that means like you know local as in new york or rhode island or boston um but a lot of the people are from los angeles okay um that being said for this particular project that's the case for a lot of the other ones i've worked on this year um we've had a ton of local people um because we're starting to build up more of a presence in the, the filmmaking community Boston is becoming a huge hotspot because of the tax incentive and Rhode Island has had its fair share of um, activity as well with uh, Gilded Age and uh, Nosferatu, which I also worked on. Um, so it seems like this area, New England in general, is going to be is, is taking off in a big way, which is really exciting. Um, and what is it about Rhode Island, do you think, that makes it a good filming location I just think that it's it's more affordable in general than filming out in Los Angeles or New York where um, it just it's so expensive to film there. So they're outsourcing to places like uh, little old New England, you know. <laughs> um, and how would someone from Rhode Island get involved in the film industry? Like if someone is listening to this thinking, oh, I didn't realize that I could be working on a movie set, like how would they get involved? um it's really funny there's no one way to do it um that's one thing that i've learned is that every person i've talked to has taken a different path into the film industry um so you've got your classic cases of my dad my uncle my brother did it so then i did an internship and they got me on set you know nepotism that's always nice <laughs> um and then you've got people like me who kind of got it was about it was a, a split an even split between getting lucky and working really hard. I just happened to make a film um, just because I felt like I needed to do something while I was in school. And then one of the people who worked on my film went to work on Little Women, uh, the Greta Gerwig film. And that got me onto Knives Out and then onto the next film, and the next film. And if you're you're competent and hardworking and you can take the hours and the crazy egos, then um, you kind of you can work your way up pretty quickly but you have to get your foot in the door and that's the hardest part um so i'd say if you want to be in this industry you it would for sure behoove you to um learn as much as you can about the filmmaking process because you know you can go to film school like i did and um they'll teach you a lot of film theory and maybe some useful things about um you know, in my case, I came from a digital cinematography background. So a lot of it was geared towards um, lighting and, and you know, like I said, film theory. And you watch a lot of great movies. Um, but you should know how a set runs in a practical sense because it is a business. And there is certain vernacular and uh, ways of doing things that are unique to the film industry that um, I haven't experienced in, in any other um any other type of business or, uh, or industry. So, um, I would say, you know, you can go online these days and just read a blog or watch YouTube videos and learn a lot that way. You don't necessarily have to go to film school. And then I'd say the other, uh, equally essential component of that whole thing is to watch movies constantly all the time, watch lots of movies, be well-versed in film history, know which films you like, um, so that if you want to be a director or a cinematographer or whoever, um, you can decide, you know, what your stylistic choices are going to be throughout your career. You know, you want to be unique and, and kind of hone your craft. So, uh, yeah. So I'd say go online, talk to people and watch movies. Well, that sounds like great advice. 
Um, Thank you. <laughs> so uh, back to the locations. Um, what is the process? And I don't know if you're involved in this process at all, but what is the process for deciding on specific locations? Like I, I know um, you did some filming in Newport, um, the sets in Lincoln. Uh, so how do people decide on where to film? Okay, so it comes down to a few critical factors. They, first off, the location manager is the person who goes out and scouts locations, right? Location manager, location scout. Um, so they'll go with the producers, the director, um, the assistant directors, and they'll all go look at the locations, the cinematographer as well. And they'll try and find um, a place that matches their budget, uh, matches the production's time frame, so we need it by this time for this amount of time. And then also, um, it's got to suit the scene. It, you have to be able to think of where the camera's going to go, um, how limited you're going to be as far as equipment. If you're bringing in a techno crane or dolly equipment or steady cam, um, that's all going to determine the availability of space. Because if you need to maneuver around and you're trying to film in a one bedroom apartment that might be difficult to do with uh, a techno crane it's going to be it's going to be impossible cuz techno cranes <laughs> are huge um <laughs> so so yeah i mean those are the main things you're thinking of um and then also suitability as far as the story obviously um and then little things that you don't think of initially like is the filming location near an airport um that's going to be a nightmare for sound we know that living right. near the airport. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, or, you know, it, are we shooting outside on a Saturday night near uh, a college campus um, or, you know, active bars? Um, and do we have security? You know what I mean? Um, that's a problem I've run into many times. Can't tell you how many times I've had to ask someone to be escorted off set by a security officer. Wow. <laughs> Get a little bit uh, rowdy, these kids. But it's all good. Um, you have to be pretty resilient to be in the industry anyways. Fair enough. Uh, but yeah, so those are all determining factors. Well, it sounds like being in a city with a college campus on a Friday or a Saturday night is probably your least favorite location. But what <laughs> has been your favorite location during the filming of Hocus Pocus 2? Ooh, let's see. What can I say without giving anything away? Well, I think I will say that I've seen a lot of <laughs> like social media posts and whatnot. I don't think uh, anyone yeah. in Rhode Island doesn't know <laughs> where filming has been. So I think you you can feel free to say which one has been your favorite oh, location. Oh, that's hilarious. The Hocus Pocus guide on Instagram is the bane of my existence. Um, probably my favorite location so far has been the, um, the Halloween festival set in Newport. Um, just because of the amount of people involved. Um, we were on location outside. That's, I prefer that. I'll take that any day to a stage day. I find those boring. I like being out in the field. Um, and there, it was just really fun. They, they did a really good job on the, uh, the set decoration and, and um, all the background dressed up. And I mean, it, it was super cool. And to have the witches there and doing their thing, it was uh, it's pretty rad. Yeah, I like that one a lot. Cool. Um, so you mentioned the witches, and that leads me into my next question. Um, have you met the three main actors, Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Kathy Najimy? I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, um, Najimy, Najimy. Have, have you met them? And if you have, what are they like? What's it like working with them? Uh, yeah, I've, I've met all three. I've had many interactions with all three witches. Um, they're all absolute dolls. Um, <laughs> Kathy Najimy is hilarious. Sarah Jessica Parker is very nice, a little bit quirky, but nice. Um, <laughs> uh, Bet is she's she's a tough one. You know, she's been doing it a long time. She's got that uh, that tenure. Um, yeah, there's the dynamic, you know, that that uh, bets the the team leader and and the ladies kind of play it up, and they're all they're all really tight with each other, and it's really cool to see them together again. And their dynamic hasn't changed at all. Um, they are always nail their performances. Like 
even if they're feeling tired or, you know, a little bit cranky or whatever, um, they, as soon as we call action, they just, they nail it every time. So I'd say they're all consummate professionals and I enjoy, I enjoy walking them to and from set, which I do quite a bit. (laughs) Um, when you say Bette Midler is a tough one, do you mean tough because of that? Like she's, she's a very good actor and, um, professional or do you mean tough to work with (laughs) well so um (laughs) that's funny but yeah by saying bet is tough i mean just that she's you know she's just like she knows what she wants she's really good at her job and she expects um other people to do to do well at their job is which is fair yeah um so she she can be a little bit demanding but that's okay because she's um, bet midler she's bet midler you know what i mean (laughs) Fair enough. Um, so I would imagine that, you know, if you were a famous actor working on a movie, I would expect to visit you on set every once in a while. So have you met or seen any other like celebrities on set, like visiting some of the stars? Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I saw I did see. um uh, uh, Ferris Bueller himself, Ms. Oh, Matthew Broderick, Mr. Matthew Broderick, visiting his wife, Sarah Jessica Parker. That's very cool. It was pretty cool. Uh, it was a little, it was a little, uh, trippy because he just kind of looked like a dad and I didn't recognize him at first. Yeah. And he had a mask on, he had the kids and I was like, wait a minute. It's been a while since Ferris Bueller. Came Bueller. <laughs> um, and yeah, Kathy and Jimmy's husband, um, he's a really funny guy. He's part of this, um, band that's featured in movies like this comedic band called the the dan band or something like that oh okay yeah he's really cool he comes and visits kathy all the time they're so sweet together he brings their um their elderly dog um i don't remember the dog's name nor am i probably at liberty to say but uh yeah mostly mostly that you know just friends and family that kind of thing it's a little tough right now because of covid Mm -hmm. we can't have people coming and just visiting all the time right um you have to be cleared and tested and all that so and yeah, so how does the production keep things safe COVID wise? Um, so we have different zones. Um, so for instance, I'm zone A, um, or some productions have zone A plus. I've been on productions where for zone A plus you have to test every single day. That's a PCR test. Um, on this production, we are testing because it's a Disney movie. Each company has its own, you know. Um, its own criteria and parameters Mm -hmm. um, around testing. So for Disney, it's I test three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay. Um, And that's a PCR test. And um, we wear masks on set all day uh, when the principal actors take their masks off to do lines. And if we're within 10 feet of them, we have to put goggles on, which this that's a first for me. I've never been on a production that made us wear goggles. And to be honest, um, I, I actively try to avoid wearing them. So I don't know why that sounds like it would look it's, really cool. It's not and be just very comfortable. that it looks super cool, uh, <laughs> but that they fog up constantly, oh, no. which is great. Um, yeah, so I, I try and be, I mean, it's easy to be 10 feet away from someone and still, you know, know what's going on. Mm-hmm. I'm usually hanging out with the director and the cinematographer and we're just talking about like, Hey, what, are, what do you think the next shot should be Nate? And I'm like, well, <laughs> Glad you asked. Uh, no, that doesn't happen. <laughs> we can let people think it happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, not speaking of the actors, but the actual characters. Who is your favorite Sanderson sister, and why? Who's my favorite Sanderson sister? I think. Um, I think Mary, uh, the um, the witch played by Kathy Najimy. She's just so funny. She's so funny. And and in this one, she's been allowed to like improvise a lot more. Oh, okay. So she has some great one-liners <laughs> and, and just like, you know, she's the more like goofy kind of like um, doltish one, if mm-hmm. you will. And then Sarah's like, you know, she's the sexy witch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then Bet's the, the leader or whatever. But like, um, I just think that, that Kathy for one is so awesome. And um, yeah, her character Mary is uh, is is super funny to watch. So I think she's my favorite. Okay. Which is which I which is probably controversial. You know, actually, when I think about like, obviously, I don't know anything about Hocus Pocus two, but mm. 
being someone who was born in the 90s, I've seen the first Hocus Pocus many, many times. Mm -hmm. And when I think about it, like on a line by line basis, like Mary has the funnier lines. Yeah. And and I mean, probably Sarah has the least funny lines. And it would be like between Mary right. and um, Winifred having the best jokes. Yes. I like I like the whole kind of like three stooges Yes. Act that they're doing. Yes. Where like, you know, Beth's clearly like the mean one. She's kind of the Mo, you know? Right. Yes. Um and, but I just think that Mary is so funny. And she's got she like I said, she's got a lot of really good stuff to yeah. to work with on this one. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a random question. Mm -hmm. What is the food like on set? Like, do you get food oh. from like local restaurants or like a catering company or how do how do you get it and how good is it? I'll tell you what, Lauren. <laughs> Unequivocally, it is my favorite part of working on set. <laughs> um, you know, the the glitz and the glamour, all that. It's overrated. The food is amazing. Um, <laughs> we have two different types of food on set. So we've got crafty, which is just like they have it on set it's like usually a table that's set up or it's served out of the back of a truck and it's just like you know snacks but any snack you could kind of want right like so chips chocolates peanuts uh uh coffee hot chocolate gatorade sodas um like i had bags of buffalo pickles like <laughs> bags of them i've never even heard of that yeah they have olives <laughs> yeah <laughs> just a lot of cool stuff so that's like the snacky component of it and then there's catering and catering is also there every day and they serve breakfast um so you get there first thing in the morning you can get your breakfast burrito or your hash browns or your french toast waffles anything you want really um and then they serve lunch which can be very late in the day or it can be you know like normal lunchtime. so they serve like the big meals they serve the you know the chicken breast and the steak and the you know, like just big entrees and things like that. Wow. They also have lots of vegan options. So there's always food. There's always food on set. And the, I mean, I've had lobster, steak, sushi, you, <laughs> wow. you name it on set. It's it's great. It's awesome. I mean, it makes up for, uh, especially with the PAs, some of us making um, minimum wage. <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely a consolation for some people on the, you know, on the lower end of the scale, the below the line folks. But uh, yeah, it is pretty awesome. That's yeah, fair enough. Um, and is that do you know if that's like a local catering company that provides that or is that um, like where does the catering food come from? Um, the catering company will differ. I will say that the craft services, uh, the crafty company, craft services company that we use on this set and I've worked with them a lot is Jane's Craft Services. And Jane is the name of the um, the key. I guess. Yeah, she's technically the key craft service the craft person craft lady i don't know i don't know what the technical Probably title is not craft lady but her name is jane willworth and she's awesome and she's like an on-set mom to me she's so sweet uh we get along very well and her catering uh her crafty company slash catering company is awesome so it's jane's uh craft services very cool yeah, um so, so cool. <laughs> um what has been your favorite on-set moment or like has anything funny happened on set um, oh my god what's your best memory yes um so there's a lot of stuff i can't say sure because uh, i can't give anything away no spoilers. but there is a there is a <laughs> there's a moment that i thought of that i can talk about so um there was a set that we filmed on where it, we were outside for a week and a half and it was very rainy and muddy and windy and and just awful i mean just, everything was waterlogged and mud up to your sh knees and it just was like i mean maybe not that much but i did walk <laughs> i did walk into work both ways uphill um so <laughs> but uh you know it was just rough really rough and it was the last day and it's freezing cold out and we were um we just had one more shot to get we had just like bur like burned down a house and it was like this big stunt scene and the last thing to get was us um there was a spider uh in a box and they brought in a spider wrangler, which I didn't know was the thing. And we all called him Spider Sam uh, because his name is Sam. And it kind of <laughs> sounds like Spider-Man, I guess. So, um, you know, basically what the director wanted was this spider to come out of this box, crawl to the edge of the table, and then descend via web 
um, <laughs> to a suitable point in the frame. So I y easier said than done. So <laughs> basically, there was a solid like hour and a half block where I mean the director's like trying to get this spider out of this box and it, it doesn't want to come out because you know there's a bunch of like sweaty middle-aged men with bright lights standing over it and a camera um so i mean i don't blame the thing but you know they're like the spider wranglers trying to tickle it with a uh, uh <laughs> with a paintbrush you know they're trying to like the director's like how are we gonna get this thing out of the box and i'm like maybe we can entice it with like a all expenses paid trip to hawaii and and like everyone laughed obviously because it was it was pretty funny, uh, uh, as are most things that I say. Um, so, uh, so basically, we were just like trying to figure out how we can get this thing out of the box. Someone um, posited the idea of, of like honey uh, because they maybe got the the idiom confused about flies and honey. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, is that a thing? What I I, I thought really I thought flies dipped in honey might be an enticing little treat, well, you know? Because they eat bugs, right? Yes, they love bugs. They they um yeah. Did so, anyone think of using a bug as no, no. no. They we honey, just yes, we just bugs, no. we just shouted at it and tickled it with a toothbrush um or a paintbrush. But the whole thing was like you know it's still an animal, so we can't be aggressive with it. Right. So you have to be like so you, you didn't know shout at it. No, we didn't shout at no. it. <laughs> but uh, I I was in my head I was cursing um cursing whatever fate brought me there um <laughs> but uh but yeah so that was a solid almost two hours of trying to get the shot of the spider and at the time i was incredibly annoyed because i was cold it was a very long day i was tired um but looking back on it it was kind of funny and yeah. spider sam was a cool dude so it was worth it i, had a I good mean conversation it's very funny from my perspective <sighs> oh good i'm glad i could amuse you it it sound it's funny to hear i'm sure being there wasn't it was infuriating <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so we got our shot of well the spider. that's good mm -hmm. it didn't actually do what we wanted to do by the way no it kind of like just slightly came out of the box and we we're like all right you know so if we see a scene in the movie where the spider comes out of the box and drops down on a web that's going to be probably cgi i would yes all right yes that's gonna be Keep CGI. An eye for that yeah um, so if you could describe the movie in three words, what mm. would they be? They can be three consecutive words or they can just be like three adjectives. Three words? Yes. Can I use four? Hmm. If you must. The witches are back. Wow. Boom. Can I drop the mic? Slow no, I clap. I own this mic. <laughs> you shouldn't drop the wanna, mic. I don't want to break it. That's a slow it, clap. But bam. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, I mean, that's all of the questions that I have. Is there anything that you want to say about the movie that I didn't ask you about? About the movie or about at working on it, et cetera? Um, uh, no, yeah. Everyone go. It's going to come out on Disney Plus. So check it out. I'm sure you're all stoked for it. I am too. Um, a lot of hard work went into it. A lot of uh, long, crazy hours, and I think it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be a good one for sure. Do you know? I'm assuming it'll be out in time for Halloween next year, probably. That or is that is the this year actually because this is 2022 oh, wow. now. Um, I believe there was a Disney Plus ad that came out that said 2022. Um, but that's about all I know, and that's all I can say contractually. Okay. But I think, like I said, I think there was an ad that did uh, specify, and you could probably go on. Hocus Pocus God on Instagram, and they'll tell you everything you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, thank you um, for taking time out of your busy schedule, even though you're currently on break. So it's not a busy schedule. Don't tell them. Thank <laughs> you for taking time out of my busy schedule. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Anytime. Um, and thank you for telling people about the movie. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I, I enjoyed talking with you, and I will talk with you more once the podcast is over because we live <laughs> together. <laughs> Roadie Radio is proud to be a resident partner of the Rhode Island Center for the Book and is brought to you by library staff and community members all around the Ocean State.